Hello Tabletop Wargamers, and welcome to Tried and True, a podcast hosted by the Delaware War Machine community. Join us as we dive deep into topics around our favorite games, exploring methods and techniques proven to enhance anyone's gaming experience. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 12th episode of Tried and True. I am your host, Paul. And I'm Erica. This is exciting. We are on the last episode of the deep dive into the Privateer Press series. Super exciting. How has it uh, been? Have you been enjoying all the episodes? Oh, yeah. It's been great. Your last interview with Doug uh, was probably... It's up there for me. I think I listened to that one twice. Yeah, he's a really cool guy. And just like talking to him. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of like War Machine hordes information. Well, I guess War Machine now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. For like a solid 40 minutes. It was great. Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of cool, exciting news that's going on. We've been keeping up with the Nightmare Empires Kickstarter. It finished. They, they I think they like almost like qu- almost quintupled their original goal, like almost $300,000, if I'm not mistaken. I just check my phone and there's always a new prize. <laughs> to be had and the uh the yeah, other kickstarter it's it's pretty cool yeah and everybody got their brine they're, they're gonna get their brine thralls so i'm looking forward to seeing all the sharks all over on the field now it's gonna be great and then even bigger news mark four just got released today so or the announcement for mark four just got released so uh, i just saw war machine horde general discord everything is just on fire with people like amazed with what's going on and all the changes and stuff yeah and it was such a tease because i was in briefings all afternoon my phone's just going off and i'm like <laughs> this really this boring afternoon and my phone's got all these awesome things i'd rather be checking out so i'm still <laughs> catching up i'm still catching up well, speaking of really awesome things that have also happened, I mean, Mark Four is going to be exciting. We're going to be following it closely. A lot of other really cool podcasts have actually been out. Seth over from the New Jersey SOB Meta, he actually just started his own podcast, the Boker Broadcast. So if you're going to take a look at that, it's over on Muse on Minis. It's him, Steve Rabideau, Artie, and Steve King on the first episode, just talking about judging and events. And it was just a great listen. It was really cool to to get that voice of positivity. Did you get an opportunity to listen to it? Uh, not yet, but also with uh shout to Seth. So in the prime cast that came out earlier today, they gave special uh, ups to Seth and the broker brawl. So it was... (laughs) I was clapping at my desk. When, uh, when as soon I as I it. saw the uh, the green New Jersey, I was like, oh, my God, that's so awesome. Yeah, you made it, it Seth. <laughs> and then uh, we also had Dan. He was on Iron Codex. So you got to go do a uh, match, a Brawl Machine match. So if you go over to Iron Codex, we'll, we'll put in the show notes. You'll be able to go in and take a look at that. It was, it was a good episode. It was, it was pretty cool. I, I liked watching his thing. So we want to take a moment to go ahead and uh, thank a couple of individuals. So More Than Dice, thank you for giving us another platform in order to go ahead and share all the good news. If you like what you're listening to, please uh, consider subscribing to youtube and check us out on facebook for all the latest updates and to our patrons on patreon thank you so much for helping us out y'all are great you you know helping us being able to do all these battle reports and if you didn't know we do have that patreon you can go ahead uh support the cause and take a look at all the good uh, benefits and i guess this would probably be a good time to to talk about the frozen forge raffle wouldn't you say yeah because it's uh we're close to five hundos yeah, I think the last time I checked, we were at 485 subscribers, so only 15 away from the actual Frozen Forge uh, giveaway. So uh, what do we want to do, just real fast, the the information, all the rules are in the show notes. You can go take a look. It's like in a Google Doc. But real quickly, we can just kind of give you a quick heads up, a little synopsis of it. There's no entry fee. One entry uh, per person is going to be valid. Anybody over the age of 18 can enter. If you're you know, 13 to 18, just you know, make sure that uh, you have a legal guardian to bless off on it. And for eligibility, probably the thing that you're like wondering about, right? Well, we have 15 $10 digital coupons to go to Frozen Forge, so there's lots of opportunities to win. So the, all you got to do is be publicly subscribed to Tried and True on YouTube. You must have your email available on YouTube. There is a way to have it set up on your profile just so that way we can go and contact you if you end up winning the raffle and just comment on at least one of the podcast or battle report episodes and have it be a constructive comment you know you know something you're interested in seeing in the future or you know if you want to see us start to make mark four battle reports when the the rules drop with that like anything constructive would be good hey just real quick as the bat rep producer and just try to make it better hey if something sucks let us know too so we can make it better <laughs> yeah it's it's constructive it's fine <laughs> And just make sure that it, it complies with, you know, YouTube community guidelines. And uh, yeah, it, really hoping that uh, it ends up uh, working out and that you uh, end up getting picked as one of the 15. Uh, Frozen Forge is great. They got sticks. They got tokens. They got so many things out there. I mean, 
you should do it. Tell a friend, make sure they're subscribed and, and, and get you some swag. All right. And then with that, that's going to get us to the actual interview itself. So this is, as I said earlier, the last episode of the Privateer Press series. And we're going to be joined with John Swinkles from Privateer Press. And he is the conventions manager. John, go ahead and say uh, hello and go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do. Oh, hi. I, I get to be I get to be the, the end cap, huh? That's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. The intro caboose. <laughs> I'm the uh, convention manager here at Privateer Press, so you can kind of guess what that entails. Basically, I get myself and any of the other staff and, of course, all of our equipment stuff out to various events so that we can uh, hang out and play games with people. That is awesome. That's great. And then for the, for the conventions, I mean, we, we've already heard about Gen Con and heard about Warfare mm-hmm. Weekend. Mm-hmm. We're really excited to ask you a bunch of questions about the conventions, so... We're just, we're really thankful that you, you know, took the time to come on Tried and True and be able to come and chat with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your time with us. I'm I'm surprised that you're able to find time today. So it's a busy day. Yeah. I can imagine. (laughs) I'm triple tasking. Are you guys like popping wine bottles? No, no. We're, we're busy (laughs) talking to people on Facebook and stuff like that because that's, that's what you do, right? Yeah. So yeah, is, absolutely. are you finding it's more positive or is it like a damage control thing or? I can tell you straight out that, that yeah, it's actually pretty overwhelmingly positive. I, I That's had great. pretty high hopes for that going in just because, you know, having seen some of the content early and whatnot, like I was like, oh, people are going to dig this. That, you know, you, you'd start to get an idea of what people are hoping for. And so when you see it come down the pipe and it's matching what you're seeing a lot of people hoping for, you're like, oh, this is going to go pretty well. So Tuesday nights are open play night. So um, after here, I'm like uh, chomping at the bit to get to the store and talk with the people that we play with just to get their <laughs> really feedback. To yeah, everyone's been well, excited yeah. on our Discord. So. Well, and you'll have some of those case case Mark IV rules of play tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, we cannot wait for that. And then uh, I'm really happy, though, that, that the... I guess the reception was really positive because we keep on saying over and over again. And I, I recently, okay, this is a little bit, bit of an aside, but I got my hands on some Mark One cards, just reading through mm-hmm. it and like reading over like Death Jack. I'm like, what the heck is this? He would just go and charge your caster, like yeah, what dude, that was ga- Mark One, man. <laughs> uh, there was that abomination rule. People used to just run their Doom Reavers into you and have your models like flee the board <laughs> it's, it's the wild west funny. back then yeah yeah and then like even on a mark ii there was still abomination stuff if, if i'm right because i was looking at those cards as well I, I guess what i'm trying to get at is that the game has only improved like i can't imagine mm-hmm. what experience it would be to play with those rules like now so mark three to mark four i i know that whatever is going to end up happening when the dust settles it, it's going to be a great game and and i'm really excited to get some you know models on the table and roll some dice yeah that's kind of been um so my husband he uh just started playing in mark three so he hasn't mm-hmm. this will be his first iteration of it and of a change and he plays protectorate so he's a little salty man right now but um well and that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the funny part too is, is i've noticed you know like you know various people going but but what about my faction right yeah and that's what i told him i was like every so this will be mark three right i've, I've danced this dance before it, every iteration gets better sure there's a little like you know, that weird in between stage where, where you're waiting, but overall the finished product, it, it's, it's just going to get better. It's, it's never taken a step back, especially this game. I mean, that's so. the goal, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like, true. Like, Facts. Like, generally the, you know, the devs and various play testers and stuff that, that we've got in here don't want to sit around and play something that's not fun. And mm-hmm. like, especially when you have to play it over and over and over and over again and refine and work on it and tool it. At a certain point, if it's not fun, you, you're done. Yeah, right? and that's actually um. So like with with our store and our community people we were talking to now, like it's kind of like a fun time to play Mark Three going into Four because everyone's just like, I'll bring whatever to the store <laughs> at this point. So it's it's um, it's really nice to have like uh, I mean like what is it? I think when we're like talking about some communities, if it's really super cutthroat, it's not approachable for newer players but the stuff that we play at our our store yeah we'll set up for a steamroller and and have those serious lists but most of the time like we just have dumb stuff like on the table we just like have fun with that oh absolutely i'm i am 100 percent as they would say a filthy casual i i am <laughs> no good at competitive play oh they made us hoodies and stuff too yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're, yeah. we're, that me and some others are just there to have fun right like like yeah sometimes someone's juggernaut is gonna run run up and just you know crack my my master skull wide open but i made a fun list, so. <laughs> yeah we're just pushing little plastic men across the table it'll be okay it'll be it'll be all right <laughs> 
Well, John, let's go ahead and, and talk about your position at Private sure. Press, right? So conventions manager, like what is your experience? I guess had, – Talking like to Lauren, she ended up having a lot of different positions at Privateer Press. Have you only been the convention manager or have you done multiple different positions or have you been a convention manager and then moved into Privateer Press? It is my second position at the company. Okay. I've been here for just a little over six years and I became the convention manager in November of 2018. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, social uh, media coordinator. Oh, dude, that's a weird time to come in at the end of 2018. I came in right with Mark III, like literally <laughs> right with it. I came. Oh, even you came to the uh, when the I company. started. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was saying when you got your uh, your convention position at the end of 2018 is what the pandemic was that was that at the end of 2019. I got I got a year. Right? Yeah, I got a year of convention. <laughs> year under like, your belt I got to do the, the whole circuit, down. and then and then the world shut down. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can, I, can I ask, like, what did you do during that time? Was it like I'm I'm actually really cu- like curious to say like. You know, are you just biting at the at your teeth, like waiting for the the conventions to open back up? Like, what? So what it, it's during that time? It, it's a little bit of a mix. On the one hand, like, yeah, there was a, a lot of that stuff that I missed, and there was a reason that you know I switched to that role, mostly because I like that work. But also, you know, having you know a bit of a genetics background and stuff like that, like I, I didn't want to be out there, right? Like, that's not <laughs> running large scale events is, is not conducive to health at that point, right? <laughs> But I kept my job, which I was very fortunate. I was able to continue helping out with some of the media and marketing stuff while looking to the future and, and organizing some of the stuff we did online in lieu of going places in person. Sure. I, I got to ask, though, because you say genetic, I'm a biology teacher. So how, how did someone with the genetics background get into management? So the long and short of it is I love the theory crafting. I love the research, but I am just not a fan of lab time. <laughs> like I, I like mixing stuff with the potential like blow up and stuff like that. Like absolutely lab time for mad science, but sitting there and wielding a micro pipette for, you know, eight to 12 hours straight and streak that Petri dish. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, and wait for, you know, bacteria and various other things to work its way up the gel. I, I, nope, <laughs> I'm out. I'm, I'm too impatient. <laughs> That's perfectly fine, man. I, like, again, like I, I understand exactly what you mean by that. It's uh, like I, my students are the exact same way. But it's funny because like when we, because I teach a microbio and you know, it's like mm. we're gonna grow, we're gonna make friends today. Yes, it's exciting. So it's just, just like a necromancer, make friends. <laughs> so on the uh, on that note, that the pandemic, you know, is coming coming to mm-hmm. a close here and things are opening back up. Um, yeah. So now that conventions are coming back, how? Do you and Privateer Press pick out like which ones to go to and attend? I mean, realistically, it comes down to what's the interaction we're going to be able to have with the community there, right? Is it going to be something where they get a benefit by us being there? And do we obviously get a benefit by being there other than just getting to hang out with people and play games, which is obviously a very good, fun thing. But at the same time, like, do we have new information for them or are we just there to take up space, right? And so that's really what it comes down to is if we've got something that we can bring to the table for that audience and that's an, and it's an audience that is going to enjoy the stuff that we are bringing to them or at least has the potential to then we're going to try to go. Then it comes down to logistics and financials. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So it's like really mostly like tabletop conventions. Like you want to go to like a, like, it, it, cause I think back to Erica, you go to MAGFest, it's music and games, right? But it's like more Mag like Fest. video games. <laughs> uh, I mean, no, there, there's a lot of board gaming. It's actually the, uh, the board gaming hall is, it, it's pretty big. It's not like PAX Unplugged big, but. But a, lo- a lot of, it, much to that point, a lot of, you know, events like MAGFest over here in Seattle, we have the Emerald City Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con this year, even like the stuff that is not typically a tabletop gaming convention. You're seeing a large increase. Some of that is because of the spike in, you know, popularity of D&D and things like that. And some of it mm-hmm. is just a lot of people are just getting into games all across the board, especially during the pandemic, because, well, they had some time at home. So they played games. So you were talking about the different the different conventions you go to, right? So we said Gen Con, mm-hmm. we said uh, Warfare Weekend, and I and I think you, mm-hmm. you guys were at Adepticon too. We yeah. we plan on going to PAX Unplugged. We were there last year, and I'm interested in going there. You know, we're talking internally about like I don't know, maybe like trying to do like a Warfare Weekend qualifier, or maybe just like an event or, or something like that. Yeah. There would would 
PP like has they have they considered PAX or Unplugged or or anything on like the East Coast? Um, so I've gone to PAX Unplugged with the company twice. The, both years weren't like right next to each other. The first uh, the first time I went, I was it was with the previous convention manager, and we had a booth, and we had like all the things. We had events and stuff like that. We did this big Battle of Boar's Gate thing. It was dope. Um, there wasn't a ton of miniatures interest and that's spiking a little bit. So I went a few years back, but I went with a local retailer who was carrying our stuff and I did demos of our stuff and we collaborated. So there's, there's different ways to attend a, a show. And so sometimes it's in full force. We bring a bunch of staff, we go, you know, bang out a bunch of events and do a bunch of cool stuff and that would be like your warfare weekends your adapticons gen cons our home convention when and if we're able to do it again like lock and load things like that and then there's times where you just go real light like we might do for nova this year or maybe you know something with packs unplugged those ones i usually are a question mark until i get a lot closer gotcha just because it comes down to availability of staff like if you know like if i can't get anyone because they're all busy working on you know legacy armies or something for mark four then <laughs> it was just it, it was just really cool being at pax because we ended up bringing our war machine models and we ended up playing a couple games out there and it was just neat mm-hmm. because we had some people they were just saying oh wow like i haven't seen this game forever and said yeah we're we play it all the time down in delaware like half an hour away and you know there's this mm-hmm. meta here this meta here this meta there so it, it was just i guess like because like the exposure or it was a question was like about the exposure because we we just we love showing that this game is still so good it's it's still so much fun and you know that that's at least like where the question was going towards so gotcha well and to and to speak to that so like for example I could take a booth. I could take four people, right? Four staff members. We could run, you know, a you know, a couple steamrollers or what have you, narrative event, whatever you got, right? The reality is, is that may get some people interested. That will bring in some people that are already in the community and give them a chance to hang out and play games and stuff. But I will tell you right now that every person that comes and sits down and hangs out with you as a player about the game is a much higher conversion rate to join the community. Gotcha. Right. So we'll get a lot of people walking through and just because of the volume, right. We'll get some new players. We'll get some lapsed players. We'll get some, you know, just a confidence boost in the existing players, but people actually just getting to sit down, hang out, nerd out and play games with each other. will always sell a game way better than any other possible. Yeah, aspect. I guess that kind of, um, our, mantra here is we always put our community uh, first before the game. Dan had a really profound quote where uh, when we were talking with Warjax and he said something along the lines of where if you just make it about War Machine and not the community, it becomes too transactional Mm -hmm. to be sustainable. Absolutely. And so it's it's nice to that, you know, because we do like we outside of the store, you know, we hang out. It just goes such like a long way to keeping mm-hmm. you know, the game alive and the community alive. So Well and that's that's what single player video games mm-hmm. are for, right? Is is to get that, you know, kind of escapism and interactivity in your escapism, but not necessarily have to, you know, interact with the community. Whereas board games, that's a required component, right? Yeah, there's some things you can do solo play stuff on and whatnot, but that's usually an enhancement of the core product, not the main part. When you're at a convention with other like gaming companies or competitors, mm-hmm. um, do you guys like give each other dirty looks behind the uh, the stands, or is it like more of a? Or do companies like talk to each other? Is it or is it pretty segregated? Um, there is a secret underground fighting ring where <laughs> the only way that people can get their their space reserved for the next year's Gen Con is if every company sends a representative to the pit, <laughs> um, and whoever you know the the last or the first person to not survive their company doesn't get a boot the next year. No, actually, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's entirely entirely amicable, right? There's not. There's not actually a whole lot of competition because everyone does something so very even slightly differently that they're just bringing more people into the medium. And so, like, if I get into the game and I'm playing D and D and I'm, you know, really enjoying that, 
D and D isn't really a competitor to say, you know, or Wizards of the Coast isn't really a competitor to Paizo in that regard because I may start, you know, picking up Pathfinder or I may go play the Dune RPG or you know, it, it's it competitor is 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 definitely probably not the word I would use. I would just call them colleagues because it's a really small community. I was going to say, yeah, when we were talking to Matt Getz in the previous interview, that's uh, he said the same thing as well with with other role-playing companies and writers and writing teams. So it's cool that you guys can kind of collab and each game system, you know, offers something different. So I Mm -hmm. play multiple games outside of War Machine Hordes as well. So I appreciate the differences between them. So yeah, shout out, much love to the tabletop games out there. Is it even helpful where it's like, hey, you know what, this game might not actually be for you, but you might want to go check out the panel or the the space over there because they might have something which you're looking for? Sometimes. Absolutely. Well, even like the art and stuff too, aesthetically speaking. So, I mean, it's one of the things I really like about Iron Kingdoms. I've always really liked the art and I have a, not that more times, you know, my first love, but the art in the original book is that dark Gothic art sure. style is like one of my favorite hands down. So like, like, I mean, that that's kind of, that's kind of a perfect thing, right? Is so if someone comes into our booth at Gen Con, probably not going to have to send them to another booth because we've got like just four wildly different games Mm -hmm. right so like if they come in and they're looking for just a pure card game yeah i'm not gonna be able to help them out but they're probably not wandering into the booth (laughs) so there's there's kind of a limited opportunity for that whereas like i'm a giant nerd and if someone you know comes up to me and like you just mentioned you like that dark very gothic fantasy vibe and stuff like that i'd be like oh well if none of this is floating your boat like you know like you might look at this over here because i saw the art for it from a friend of mine's blog post and it looks freaking amazing right i picked it up the writing's really good you should check it out do you find that with with your four different games that you have there right riot quest war machine Warcaster and Monpok. Does that help Privateer Press stand out from the other companies and the conventions? Like how how have you seen, I guess, Privateer Press's presence change throughout uh, the, the years? Or even because I guess he said that you you started in 2018. Did you visit their booths before then? To, to see like what it was like? So actually, I go even further back. I used to own a game store that was blocks from where the original office was. So I've, I've known the company for a bit, <laughs> 20, 20 years to, to be exact. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the RPG is where it all started, right, with the Witchfire trilogy moving on to the rest of the Iron Kingdom's content, all that other kind of good stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I think it does help us stand out a bit because as we've gone, I mean, we used to have the Bodgers line as well and some, and some other things. So we've always kind of diversified the portfolio, if you will. But it's just because there, there are so many ideas, right? Sure. And those ideas require different executions. But, you know, like when you have an idea like Monster Pockets, you can't just sit on that. You got to play with it, right? And then if it ends up being good, you're like, okay, well, now we have to make it. So, <laughs> like, it just it, – we're pretty fortunate that people like our stuff. And so while we're not necessarily a very big company, we do have some resources, especially in the creativity that's accumulated here over the years that we can we can play around with things outside of just one title all right so john uh do new players look at the games with interest or hesitation they find when they come over like do you guys have to pull these people walking by in or do you find that no no we don't we don't (laughs) we're again we're kind of fortunate Mm -hmm. it's it's not necessarily you know like you know like removing my own ego because i don't make the games right right i've done some playtests and stuff but i just straight up don't make them but when you see a giant you know, picture of this huge four color comic monster, <laughs> you know, slamming a big meaty fist into a giant robot that, you know, is shooting rockets all over the place. You're going to walk up and you're going to be like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I don't, I don't know what that is, but I do know what that is. And I know I want it. So like it, it, the, between the art and just how the games play, if people are walking by watching a game in motion or they're seeing like, you know, the displays and stuff like that, it's a pretty quick decision process. If they are hesitant or not interested, they don't even stop long enough that you could, mm-hmm. you know, be a carnival. So um, with going to the conventions with your, with your team, since you guys have so many different IPs, do you, is it difficult to... I guess be able to remember everything and all the different games to be able to discuss like how much how, how much you gotta know going in 
And then, like, how much detail do you go in? Like, is it just you you give them this is what you need to know to play the game, or I guess like how, like too much information is too much. Like, you weren't going to go show. Yeah, like you can't word vomit. War Machine hordes rules it's... on new people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about threat ranges. Yeah, it's realistically going to come down to each person that walks up, right? Because yeah, there are some people that come up. They have you know they have a, a mighty need to know what say Monster Apocalypse is about, right? And so, yeah, that person, you know, if they if they want to get a demo in, you just show them a monster turn, then a unit turn. You ask them if they have any questions. If not, you're like, well, you know how to play the game now, and here's how you get in, right? And it can be really short, sweet, and simple. Other people are like, okay, well, what happens if I do this, right? They want to know all the nitty-gritty details of the rules. And if you have time, right, you're not completely slammed, you go through that stuff with them. If, you're, if you don't know the answers to that, you punt to one of the other people who does, or... If you don't have time and like that part of the booth is really packed, luckily we usually have open gaming going on in whatever event space is nearby. We'd be like, hey, so-and-so is running full games of this over in the thing, and they will literally let you use their dudes and you can play the whole thing. That's awesome. I like it. So speaking of the dudes and the stuff that you have on display, how -hmm. do you travel to these conventions with all the things? Like I think like like Adepticon, right? Yeah, the studio paint scheme, yep. Orgoth. How do you safely transport them from Washington to where was Adepticon? You don't check those Chicago. bags, do you? Just out, just out, just out, <laughs> just outside of Chicago. Uh, no, you do not check those bands. They don't leave your cold, dead hands, even if someone assaults you. <laughs> so when it comes to the studio models in particular, uh, that's not going to be really replaceable, right? Right. Like it could be, but incredibly expensive. And of course, you know, like the first thing, you know, like that at least, you know, 20% of the people that walk up to the booth that know the game and stuff like that always ask how much for everything in the case, <laughs> right? It, without fail, you're always going to get that question. And the answer to that question is uh, $50,000 per month. That's not accurate, but I, I, I feel if you, you know, earnestly offered that much per model matt might consider if you're the person with the briefcase <laughs> like carrying these models around is it like super stressful i mean i i heard that doug actually had the models in during adepticon i mean i i i don't make any you know any uh, sort of looking for i don't try to hide the fact that i for example have an anxiety disorder and i'm often one of the ones carrying the models so yeah there's some stress associated with it but at the same time you know you know how it's packed you pack it really well you treat everything really carefully and you just do your best to get it there in one piece every once in a while a sword pops off and it's got to get glued, glued back on but if you do your best to be careful it'll get there safe and, and then like okay this might this is an aside question where are the studio models are they just like at a warehouse or are they like at privateer press headquarters it's about 20 feet from me outside my office oh. in giant glass oh wave to him for me oh i want to see them. And all that other kind of good stuff <laughs> that's really cool. well it was really funny because like uh, i was gonna I'll probably end up taking a picture later today of at least some of the cases. There's there's too many to fit in one shot sure. um, because people have been asking you like, what about all my old models in Mark IV? I'm like, well, we're not getting rid of all of these. Why would we expect you to? Yeah. <laughs> I was just like wondering because again, like I actually was wondering that it's like when you get the because remember like the, the the pictures you get the model you'd see it and just where is it mm-hmm. afterwards? And I, I'd always just like wonder like what what happened with them. So it's like a vault, like a Disney vault. A Disney vault <laughs> on display, very, very proudly here at the office. We've had the uh, benefit of having some exceptionally talented painters over the last what seventeen years, as far as War Machine is concerned. At this point, because yeah. I know we did the fifteenth anniversary, like pretty much right before the do, pandemic. So, do you guys offer? Sorry, just really quick. Uh, do you guys offer like if people come out to Washington, like do you guys do tours of your like model studio at all? No, we. We don't. We don't really have the. We don't really have the a way to do that. Mm. Unfortunately, like we don't want to NDA a bunch of people coming through the door. Oh yeah, that's fair. That's fair. We don't want a bunch of people to like you know, like, you know, turn their screens off and stuff because you know people are constantly working on stuff and you don't want to have to worry about that at all. Very easy for something to leak out and stuff at that point. I was uh, like, I was, I was and, and it's not always it's not always the leak, but like you know, there's also you know a little bit of you know proprietary information that goes how we into how we do what sure. we do with things, and it's just why risk it when the reality is is like you know like when we go to certain shows, we bring it with us so you can come look at yeah. it, right? Like those studio models that we were just talking about that are on display at conventions are the same ones we you know keep in our case here, so it's yeah. <laughs> okay and then going back to the actual interview itself go, like uh, these display cabinets with the with the studio models 
like mm -hmm. I, I i go back to what is it like i think like in in grocery stores it's like they they strategically pick where the kids breakfast cereals are because they're eye level to the kids and all the healthy stuff is up where the adults are <laughs> do, do, do you have like the same thing with like the models on which shelf they actually go on to no half of like a, a good chunk of them are war machine a good chunk are hordes uh they're sorted by faction and then there's shelves for riot quest shelves for monster apocalypse etc gotcha okay it's just it's just by game and, and faction if you will <laughs> i think the only one that's not separated by like faction really is riot quest and mini crate stuff sure so when you're going to conventions do you set up demo tables for each of the games if so how do you show the game in a limited scope so players are excited to try it out and you're not overwhelming them or they go off to like that open play area that you were talking about. Right. Um, so pretty much uh, to expand a little bit on what I you know mentioned before is yeah if you're if you if you have staff at a show and we're not doing some kind of demo, uh, whether it's for just whatever is the newest or all the games, that's to a certain extent some wasted human resources because the you want to engage with the existing community, but you also want to make sure you are available to welcome new people. And demos are usually the easiest way to do that. Right? It facilitates the conversation that both of you want to have, and it's still a way to sit down and play games with people. Uh, as far as how to demo them, realistically, it's find a situ like if you're trying to go for a short one. Um, I used Monster Apocalypse as a as a reference earlier. Of me as the demo, I will start my monster turn and do stuff. Right, and I'll explain what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Uh, to the opposing force and then i present the other player with what they can do on their monster turn right so you saw what i did you got an idea here are some options you can go with you'll power up you'll get this stuff explain how power up works because it's pretty central mechanic to the game right and then they at least got to have you know the two big monsters fight mm -hmm. right which is really the core piece of the game if the light hasn't gone out of their eyes at that point which is pretty rare then you do the unit turns Okay. Right. Show them how to spawn things, how bump spawns work, all that other kind of stuff. So get into a couple more of the mechanics. Right. So, and that's that's the way it is with with any of the games. Is you start with what's the show stopping portion. You set up the demo so you're at that stage. You show off that core component of any given game, and then you start to break it down further as you have time and have interest. So, with your with your demo tables, when you're setting them up, do you try and I guess project more of that world or that lore on that table? So, if you're like demoing like a war machine, so we we talked about our store, like how bad ass would it be to get like a train mm -hmm. yard as a map? Like, do you guys incorporate that kind of stuff into your your demo tables? Uh, pretty often, but again, it, it mixes by show and what's happening. Right. So like we have definitely done like, you know, like War Machine Hordes demos like we did at, you know, near the beginning of the launch of uh, the most recent edition where we're, they were on big, beautiful featured terrain things. And you had two players that were kind of pantomiming out the, the action while you had a narrator explaining what each side was doing. And it was being sh caught on camera and shown up on a big screen. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, you can go all the way from that to. I'd say for a weekend, for example, we just, you know, like we had folks sitting down with some signage, neoprene mats for the games they were playing, some, you know, decent tabletop level quality painted miniatures and off they go. Right. So it can literally go one side or the other. It just depends on the show, the crowd and what your objective is. That's pretty cool. And then because you've been doing this, I like because you've been with Private Your Press and as uh, going to the conventions and then also being the convention manager what has been the most rewarding or maybe even like i guess like the most rewarding or maybe even the most challenging interactions that you've had like doing this uh, so the, i mean the the most rewarding is when you get the opportunity to interact with someone you got into a game right so if you got someone all hyped to go play riot quest and you get to see them again at another event or at you know the same one the year or a few years later or whatever and they're just loving it that's pretty damn important yeah right that's 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 pretty great it, and it's not necessarily because like haha i sold that person you know x number of dollars of stuff it's definitely much more of a that guy thinks the stuff we're doing is really cool and now that gal over there like is super into this game and had no idea what it was before and is just loving it. like i that, that's great 
especially when you deal with a lot of people online, getting to see those types of interactions in person is fantastic. And then how about like maybe like a challenging interaction or stuff that we don't see like with that comes along with the position? So most of the most of the challenge really comes down to the logistics, right? Because you've got a lot of stuff that's going to go out of your hands. Right. So like just yesterday, the vast majority of the booth and product and stuff for Gen Con got put on a truck. Right. So that is on its way to the show. We, you know, we did our best efforts to make sure everything is packed correctly. I have three different lists that I keep just in case I miss something. Right. But you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy is the idiom. Right. Something's always going to be forgotten. Something's always going to break. Something's always going to happen that requires being able to adapt quickly. And that can be stressful. But at the same time, it can go into that rewarding thing when, like, you know, this big problem happens, you figure out the solution, execute it, and it actually ends up working out sometimes even better than your original intention. And so, like, that's like, that goes from, you know, Oh crap! Oh crap! Oh crap! Woo! <laughs> no, that, that I, I definitely hear you about the logistics thing. I, I even find it now in teaching or, or anything at that point. When you forget something, you feel it. But but you're absolutely right about being able to adapt to the situation. And I think what's also even rewarding is that when you have these potential you know players that are interested in your product and, and they don't see you sweat. You know, and, and I even think like that's even rewarding. Oh, absolutely first time that i was in charge of lock and load right just the overwhelming generosity of people that would come up and tell me how much fun they were having how this was really cool or how that was really neat or this was a problem but this is how it got resolved or something like that like yeah like any grinch is gonna have their heart grow three times that day <laughs> like it's it feels good right it feels good to make other people's days and that that's really a lot of what it is all right. Well, that gets us to the end, at least like the blessed off questions. I had an 11th place. It was the, the Primecast Plus questions, if applicable. <laughs> yep. I Hit me. Erica, did you have anything that you wanted to ask? Um, I'm trying to think because I'm still a little behind on all of the uh, all the new information. Let me noodle on it. Uh, you go sure. ahead and go first. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> okay. So Mark IV has just been announced and... I mm-hmm. guarantee that you are going to Gen Con, you're going to Warfare Weekend, you know, with your trucks, right, full of the stuff, and, and you're ready to go on a mission. I Oh, are these marked trucks, by the way, or unmarked trucks? <laughs> you, you would not be able to identify them. It's, it's the Armada trucks, or not the Armada, yeah. whatever, yeah. the, the you, bank you, trucks. You, you, Secret you, trucks. You will, not be able to, you will not be able to get in a number of cars and pull a heist for your family. Yeah, the, the trucks probably have, like, pictures <laughs> of bananas on the side of them or something. <laughs> Who knows? It, it all changes hands because rarely unless you dedicate a whole truck does only one truck go from point A to point B. So what I want to ask though is because you're talking about the Mark IV and you're talking about these demo tables or we don't even talk about the demo tables. What what are some things as let's say I'm a Mark III player going, mm-hmm. What what is one thing that you're going to show me that you think I'm going to walk away being impressed and being super stoked about Mark IV? I mean, realistically... Like it, there's there's no point in denying that being able to have magnets that come with the war jacks to be able to magnetize them and have modular weapons. And- Dude, that's really cool. I'm like super hyped about that. Has any other company done that with having magnets already in the kits? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I don't think I'll so. Be honest, I don't think sure. so either. Like the fact that I've read that they were going to go and get it, I'm like, that's so cool because you're literally encouraging players that this is the way that you should be building this model. So we're going to empower you to, to go and have it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you'd be like me and have like 200 different skavens with all different weapons because you never know what you're going to need. <laughs> and 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 I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. Like at least some of my Warcaster stuff that I have at home is fixed in a certain platform because I was originally painting them to be demo models, but ended up having fun with them. <laughs> I also like the um, on the subject with the models with the magnets. I love how with the assembly of them because mm-hmm. some of the older models were just such a nightmare, like a nightmare sandwich to put together. So I like I think it's an accurate statement that this is the future of how models are going. It's 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 great to see that you guys taking a chance with it and making that leap. I think so. And it's it's one of those things of like, you know, like there's there's certain things that you will learn and certain skills you will acquire as like say a traditional sculptor versus a digital sculptor and vice versa. So in that arena it's not necessarily that one is inherently better than the other, but there's definitely a benefit as far as how you get 
your materials across and stuff like that. And when you're looking at the, you know, this as a form of a manufacturing process for getting the models in people's hands, it there's a lot that allows us to do. And those benefits are pretty big. So like Andy, he's he loves the game part of, of War Machine mm-hmm. of Horrors. He hates the hobby part of it. So I know he's excited for the way that the the models that are going to be assembled now because for players like him it's more accessible because i see people at the store like pinning models with drills and stuff i'm not doing that you know <laughs> like i'm not doing all that yeah no it's cool uh so kudos to to privateer press did you have a content creator question did you want to ask i i do i don't know how to so john I'm new at the like YouTube thing. So I, I I do the battle reports for our channel. So we're kind of on mm-hmm. this discussion of, okay, so so where do we go at this point? Do we continue production of Mark III of what we're doing until the end? Like for content creators that are out there with, I guess we're getting rules in October, that might feel that they're kind of stuck because it's like, okay, you know, we've been focusing on Mark III, but now we have this, this brand new game system coming out. Like how, how do we mm-hmm. transition? <laughs> Well, so a lot, a lot of that is in the the article that mm-hmm. came out to accompany the Primecast Plus today. Um, literally has a section of like you know basically what to do next as as players, right? Which is what anyone who's a content creator is ultimately also a player. Uh, the the short version of that you don't do anything different because at least through the end of this year, every event we go to is going to be running the current edition of stuff, okay. right? Sure. If you or your audience has interest in playtest interactions and stuff like that, or, or beta interactions, if that's a better term, then by all means, grab some of the stuff at Gen Con or online when it becomes available, play around with it, you know, go through the rules that come out tomorrow. And then when it launches in October officially, right, you have all that more finalized stuff in front of you. Like you will be able to determine if at, if at that point you want to roll the content over to that edition or if you still need time to play with it. There's going to be a lot of different points where you can make that decision. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, it's going to come down to what are you going to have fun producing as content or playing with your yeah. friends? And what are your friends going to have fun playing with you or your audience going to enjoy watching? And I'm pretty sure they'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I think that kind of goes back to earlier in the conversation where we talked about adapt adaptability. I mean, definitely everybody here on Tried and True in the community, um, we're all for the the changes and adapting to, to what's coming out. But just with change, you know, it's a little scary at first. <laughs> well, and, you know, that also kind of that also kind of dovetails into you know the folks that are asking what they're going to do with their old models, right? And I've I've been answering that question a, a good bit on Facebook and various other places, and it's it's in the article, but the article is pretty dense. There's there's a lot to read there, but the the simple answer, a lot of people did that TLDR was it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the thing is is, is you can't TLDR it right? Mm -hmm. People are like, oh, we just need a summary. Okay, the summary is there's a new edition. If you want all the information, want all your questions answered, you you gotta go read this, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's it's just a simple answer. If you only want to know one or two things, you ask those questions and people are answering them. I'm sure we'll turn it into an FAQ very soon. But um, you can't always predict what needs to be on an FAQ, so sometimes you just gotta let it get out there and let people ask those questions. Uh, Like, you know, they're asking a lot of clarifying things about how they can use their armies and stuff like that. Like I said, we've got, you know, walls full of models here. We're not throwing them away and we don't expect you to either. Are they all going to be playable in the Prime Arena, which is the limited format that comes out with Mark IV? No, that, that's part of the thing that we go into. But that Unlimited Arena is a supported, viable, organized play format. And that allows all of your existing models plus the new Mark IV models. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to. Well, I mean, all the I thought the release schedule was awesome. So thank you guys for for doing that, putting out that roadmap. But the uh, I think what the spring is that when the organized play document supposed to uh, spring of uh, so it some parts of it will actually be out a little bit before. Like there'll be some steamroller information, some stuff coming out later this year, and then basically the finalized and the first events will happen early next year. Okay, cool. Awesome. It's probably the easier way to put it. And then, you know, like there's also some of those, you know, legacy models and stuff, at least, you know, two armies for each currently existing faction that already exists in the game will have those two armies as legacy content for the prime arena 
by October. So uh, for terminology, when we're talking, uh, when I read the uh, die, what it was, uh, armies, and then what was the other thing, Paul? It's uh, factions. Cadre. You have factions, factions, and then you have your armies that fall under the factions, and then you have cadres that work for multiple armies. So am I right? So yeah, I mean, ex- it, pretty much exactly. The the simplest thing to do in your head is to take the word faction and just throw it away. Check. <laughs> Right. Throw away the word faction. Right. Because reality is like, you know, these things are different, like nations and stuff like that, which we have commonly in the past and up through this you know, newest edition have been calling factions. But realistically, that's not what you were going to go play. I'm not going to go play Signar. I'm going to go play Storm Legion. So would it be a fair comparison to look at the term armies as like a new theme, like a new word for theme? I mean, you could, but that's it's not quite the same kind of rapper i i what i can like see it maybe being and with with everything that's happened with the infernals right they pretty much destroyed your you know a lot of these different what's the word i'm looking for a lot of the different cultures right that just like that the nations literally got destroyed and i always came on going back to retribution right there it's like whatever happened to ios happened to ios so i'm going off of like saying that the the two armies that you're seeing here is just maybe like an established like this is maybe like what the um, original one was probably it's probably closer to say like you've got within the army you've got the cavalry right right, right? and that's a very specific you know like type of like job you can go do and you know with the as other jobs within it right you may have a cavalry battalion right versus you know the uh you know one of the airborne divisions or things like that you're going to go play an army all of those things may belong to signar or Kador or what have you but you're not really mixing and matching those right the only thing that's moving around is you may have a cadre or something that you might think of as you know i'm trying to use modern day terminology so the the parallel might get lost a little bit but you might have a very specialized task force that will go work with this airborne division sometimes but then may get you know deployed to go work with you know the ground pounders over here instead so on the on the with the terminology thing so are cadre kind of like what we know as rec options or merc merc friendly options kind of kind of but again kind of but again those 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 terms don't really apply the same way they would in previous editions. So it's it's difficult to map them mm-hmm. that way. I think going from like Mark 3 to Mark 4, I just think that there's so many changes that we're trying to look for what are the the grounds of familiarity but it's not familiar because sure. everything is new at this point. And I think I think a lot of that's going to get cleared up tomorrow. Sure. When when those when those beta rules mm-hmm. come out is because I think people will see that there's not a huge amount of changes. It's a very digestible and we'll even have an insider that explains what those differences are and why we did them. Right. So you'll, you'll get that full breakdown. I think right now at the moment, due to lack of tabletop context, some of those changes in terminology have been a little daunting. I was going to say um, with the uh, with the new app that was discussed too in the document earlier today, mm-hmm. I'm excited to see kind of like a version of No Quarter coming back. I was a big fan of the magazine back in the day, so so are yeah, we. so yeah. Um, that was that was awesome. So thank you for bringing it back. So it, it, it just <laughs> it, it well it provided a way that we can deliver that content, make sure it's going to go to all the people that want it, sure. and that they and that we have a way to pay to generate and that, that the content. uh the the new app's gonna be open to like all, all the factions all the rules so it makes it makes the game yeah, so you, much more you will, accessible you will, just, you will just have all the stuff yeah. right and then it's also got you know enhanced ways for us to be able to collect feedback from the player base and then compare it to what's actually being used and stuff like that uh there's there's some cool stuff going on under the hood in there that just makes the game better for everybody. And then last, sorry, last quick question about subscription stuff. Um, are you guys still going to mm-hmm. support uh, mini crate in Mark IV? Oh yeah, we've got we've got mini crates still coming. I don't know that I don't know what will map to what and to what sure. extent. Like I can't say that you know this model is going to map to this solo or this thing over here. I, that I honestly don't know. But mini crate continues and. I actually wanted to go back to like those prime cast like questions. So you're talking about the, the, the Gen Con box, sorry, the, the truck full mm. of Gen Con stuff. I really liked yeah. reading over the SKU plan where it's yeah. like, here mm-hmm. is your 50 point. 
here's what you need to go to 75 and here's what you need to go to 100 i i, I mean it's not really more of a question i just think that that's really cool where it's like do you like this game do you think it's cool here's a box this is everything that you need compared to the original battle boxes where it was what was it it was like you'd get like just the battle group it was a dude and like three robots right. Yeah, I was then, there. Or you, <laughs> or you get the uh, the the old army forces, the 2017 ones that you'd maybe get a little bit more mm-hmm. stuff, but the price point was like 120 some dollars or something like that. It was just it was a lot versus I think that the barrier yeah, to you're entry- still saving like like 30 percent ish on the you know a la carte cost of those guys. i was saying just online i think this is like such a great better barrier to like it lowers the barrier to entry for new players and i'm really really excited by that and i'm really excited to, to hook our store up when it's available I, I think so too and if 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 people want to go a la carte right and be like i just want this warcaster i just want this warjack and stuff like that they can do that but they'll they'll end up spending more money that way but if they really want to you know like tailor like i really just want these things and go for it but i mean like if you're going to start playing you know uh grave diggers which is one of the other uh, uh armies that falls into the signar umbrella we mentioned earlier uh, it's going to be just so much easier to just go by the starter right it's just it's going to save you time and money so with with the new starter boxes again i i haven't read through the whole document yet is it are they confirming two player battle box sets or no no okay no no, because we, 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 we've done those in the past, and one of the things that is always a friction point in moving them is people will say that, you know, like, like oh, I want to get into this game at the same time with my friend, and right. we're going we're gonna to jump in together. But the reality is, is that almost every time one of the two people in that hypothetical doesn't want to play the army they feel like they're getting sure. stuck with, right? Or vice versa, sure. right? Someone feels like, like they're going, well, I'll go ahead and take this faction because i know you really love these guys and i really want you to get into this game they're being very altruistic and awesome but at the same time they're 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 dimming down their own enjoyment of the game. we just we don't want that either so it's really simple you get the thing you want your buddy gets the thing they want. i i actually can agree with that because i remember my buddy ended up getting the warhammer 40k starter box and he's like i got space mm-hmm. marines that's what i wanted here's orcs and i'm like okay i'll try this out and it just like it wasn't for me like i just did it because it was like you know free stuff but no i i i can actually agree with that that point of logic it it makes a lot of sense yeah and i mean like you know like like you look at you know there's also different opportunities for promotions and bundles and stuff like that so like you know there's gonna be there's gonna be stuff (laughs) there's gonna be ways to get in into the game but as far as as far as the cost of the army boxes and stuff like that the amount that you're saving by going that route as a player is a no-brainer if you want the stuff that's in there. The only way it's not is if you don't want the stuff that's in there, in which case you go a la carte, you'll pay a little bit more, but you will get very specifically what you want. There was a question I did want to go and ask, is that because you talk about being a manager and Mm -hmm. being able to, you know, you go to these conventions to try to interest new players. What can we do as community leaders locally be able to do to help out with this like i guess like keep our our players up to up to snuff making sure that they look at the you know the big gigantic article what what are things that we can do in order to support it like what what are we able to go and do the community groundswell right where you have you know like what what others would refer to as like grassroots marketing and word of mouth right that's what you do you like like i mentioned much earlier in the interview you sitting down and playing a game with a new player because you're passionate about the game and you love it will sell more games that per sit down than anyone going through a booth. Right. And that's, and that's just, that's just what it is. If you want to support the game in your area, play it. That's, 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 but that's literally it, you know, enjoy the game and be welcoming. You can still be competitive and be welcoming, right? You can be entirely casual and be welcoming. Even if the person wanting to get into it wants to be competitive. Are uh, with Mark Four coming out? Are there going to be uh, like campaigns for the game that came out? So I think one of the last ones. So I I play Grimkin. So I remember like maybe a year mm-hmm. after they dropped, mm-hmm. there was like the, the Hall yes and, and all like the Wicked Harvest. Yep. Like, is there going to be uh, similar yep. game modes? I think Lauren was even I guarantee it. Yeah, Lauren was mentioning that the that Oblivion campaign. Is guarantee there. it. Yep, I guarantee it. That's going to be one of our primary focuses. 
is that something that you to bring to the like conventions or is that just gonna be like more so done like 100 percent? okay 100 percent. like the, your first taste will actually will actually be with the ikrpg we've got an event that's listed in the gen con thing called menoth's fury road and people are gonna lose their minds oh andy i like that <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hey, John, just wanted to, you know, this was a great time talking with you about, you know, being a convention manager and everything there at Private Tier Press. And just, you know, what I think from all of us on trying to, we're just really, really happy that you're able to come onto the show. We were just wondering if you, uh, if you had any uh, closing remarks of anything that's coming up or conventions that we should try to uh, hunt you down at. Um, yeah, like I was saying, Matt, obviously we'll be at Gen <laughs> Con, um, and then uh, as you mentioned, we'll be at Warfare Weekend later this year. Uh, there's a possibility of something going on with Nova, but that hasn't been 100 percent locked in, and that's getting pretty close. So, oh, uh, I hope so. That, uh, we're going to be going to Nova. We're doing the team tournament, so I, I, I would love. It's my only. I think my only opportunity I'm going to be able to see you guys. So please, <laughs> we'll Erica, did you have any final comments? Yeah, thank you so much for you know sh- again sharing your time with us and spilling a little bit of the mark of 4t it's appreciated uh so andy and i are actually we're, we're going out to warfare weekend for our first time this year so i'm um, i've never been before so i'm super excited and i hope i get an opportunity to meet you and and some of the other fine members of privateer press uh while we're out there well there will be there will be a, a, a good number of us there so you will definitely get your chance <laughs> Hey, if I bring my Iron Kingdoms, but like the new five edition book, would you guys like sign it? Yeah. I mean, we're nerds. If someone like acts like we're cool, we we eat right out of their hands. All right, cool. (laughs) (laughs) I was talking to Andy. I was like, I'm going to bring my book and see if like these guys will sign it. I think that'd be really cool. All right. Awesome. Cool. Well, I guess, um, yeah, let's see you guys in a couple of months. Absolutely. You're going to now sign so much stuff there. Like everyone's going to be like, here, sign my battle box, please. (laughs) I don't really get asked very often. It's happened a few times, and like it's like you know, yeah. So you're gonna like sign my book. I'll bring my book. But, I'll bring my book. But, but but for the most part, it's like it's like it's like it's like I didn't make that. Now, when it comes to the to the IKRPG, I can I can sign that because I at least have a little bit of writing. In there. there you go. That's awesome. Well, hey, John, thank you again for for coming out. This this was awesome. Thank you for being the final guest on the deep dive into privateer press and with that everyone that's going to go ahead and conclude this series i mean it's the summer of 22 and we only have amazing things to look forward to we have mark four right around the corner and you know everything else that's going to happen so from all of us here in delaware we want to thank you for coming and listening and giving us your time and we'll catch you on the next series take it easy everybody bye